Hello everyone, welcome back to the latest session. In the last session, we were uh, looking at the different oxidizing agents that are used as disinfecting agents. And in that context, we looked at HOCl and OCl minus and the relevant acid base chemistry and equilibrium. Why? Because HOCl is a much stronger oxidizing agent compared to OCl minus and their ratio, you know, it's like a balance, right? If the total OCl minus is this, Depending on the pH, it's going to either tip this way, more HOCl and uh, less OCl minus, or if I increase the pH, it's going to tip this way. So, you know, uh, what we wanted to illustrate in the last session was that pH will play a role uh, in deciding this equilibrium between the acid and its conjugate base. And obviously, pKa, the acid dissociation constant will come into picture. So, let's move on and look at what else we were discussing. Then we started looking at disinfection byproducts. For example, I am adding my oxidizing agent Cl2. As long as it reacts with my pathogens, this is fine. I want this to happen. But uh, it is not just pathogens that are present in the uh, solution. You will still have some organic matter, right? And this organic matter can be the organic matter left from my treatment activated sludge process. After activated sludge process, some of the microbes can come out, uh, which are not pathogens or some of the substrate can come out because you can't really achieve 100 percent efficiency. You are always going to have BOD of 10, 20 or even 30 depending upon the type of process you are using. So, you always will have some organic content. In water, natural waters, river waters, you will have what is referred to as natural organic matter. Why do we say natural? Because the sources are from natural sources, leaves dead aquatic plants and such, let us say dead aquatic life. So, you when they die again, they are going to leach into the water and you are going to have natural organic matter. So, but if chlorine or this oxidizing agent reacts with organic matter, I will have what are called as disinfection byproducts. This I do not want to form. So, the case is clear. I want to choose that oxidizing agent depending upon the its ability to effectively inactivate the pathogen at hand while not forming a lot of or relatively limited disinfection byproducts. So, that is the key. Another aspect to limit formation of disinfection byproducts is to see to it that the organics concentration is less so that even if I add the chlorine, then disinfection byproducts are not going to be formed. Let us dig further. So, formation we already looked at this. The key aspects are we want an oxidizing agent which is usually chlorine and we need a electron donor, this is an electron acceptor and obviously, for the redox reaction here, the electron donor is the organic matter, let us see. Let us move on. So, typical natural organic matter structure, as you can see, it is not a simple what do we say compound and there is no one structure. You have it is pretty long chain, you have lot of aromaticity. So, it is a complex molecule, obviously life, right. So, uh, you have humic acid, fulvic acids and such. So, they are all part of this natural organic matter. So, what we want to illustrate is that it is a pretty complex molecule, let us say. Again, this is only a typical representation. So, what happens when we add Cl2, right? So, when we add Cl2, it can lead to oxidation and the byproduct of that case will be Cl minus, okay, that is fine. Or it can lead to substitution to form chlorinated organics, which are called the disinfection byproducts, let us say. Right? So, this is fine, it is not toxic to us at those levels, but when we have substitution to form chlorinated organics, that is when we are going to have issues. So, how will it work? So, I have HOCl or Cl2 and I have these aromatic rings, I am going to have substitution, let us say 1 Cl, 2 Cl or 3 uh, Cl, let us say. Right? And small segments, I guess, can break off and one common product is CHCl3 chloroform, let us see, right. So, these kinds of uh, disinfection byproducts are called trihalomethanes. Methane is CH4. So, the different kinds of uh, what do we say, THMs are C, 
H3Cl, CH2Cl2, CHCl3, right? Trihalo. So, trihalogen, Cl is a halogen, Cl minus is a halogen and you have trihalomethanes, let us say, right? So, trihalomethanes and these are toxic to us and if there is bromide Br minus present, so it can also lead to kind of formation of disinfection byproducts, but in general when we there is bromide, uh, we are typically concerned with its reaction with ozone, let us say. So, we saw earlier that ozone can also sometimes form uh, disinfection byproducts, but that is the case when there is Br minus, that is something to keep in mind, right. So, different kinds of uh, disinfection byproducts, one class is the trihalomethanes, other class is the haloestic acids, right, Le we will come back to that. So, in India, let us say, at least based on my limited experience, the dissolved organic matter is a concern. When there is high dissolved organic matter and chlorine comes in contact with it, you are going to have disinfection byproducts which are carcinogenic to humans. Uh, depending on the concentration, level of exposure and time of exposure, but they are certainly toxic and a sure way to kill the aquatic life. That is something to keep in mind. So, that is why whenever in India at least wastewater treatment plants people try to use chlorine, uh, you know, they do it for two reasons because their activated sludge process or the biological treatment does not work very well due to poor maintenance or due to poor operation sludge retention times being very less or soil retention time being less and so on. So, here they use chlorine for two purposes, not just for disinfection, chlorine is also an oxidizing agent. So, you can oxidize the organics left, so it will be as if BOD is less, but by adding this amount of chlorine you are forming a hell lot of disinfection byproducts which you are releasing into the water body and killing or affecting aquatic life greatly. So, thus again the enforcement agencies are not looking at it, but again if you are either an informed citizen or end up uh, being in charge of a plant, hopefully you will look into that. Do not add chlorine to what do we say wastewater treatment plant effluents, at least that is uh, based on science too. So, in India though, uh, what is it now? The DOC is very high, I am not calling it dissolved organic matter. Why? In the context of Indian surface water bodies, it is not just the organic matter from the natural sources that is of uh, issue or I am not calling it NOM, pardon me. I am not calling it natural organic matter, I am calling it dissolved organic carbon or dissolved organic matter, right? Uh, because here we have high influence of the humans or anthropogenic sources of organic content uh, are pretty much prevalent, let us say. So, that is why I am not calling it as NOM. And that is the reason why it is pretty high, DOC or DOM levels are very high in India, especially in Yamuna. In general, let us say it is 2 to 3 or 2 milligram per liter in most developed countries. So, when I add chlorine either for water treatment or for wastewater treatment, so at least for water treatment, I add chlorine to disinfect the water, I add a lot of chlorine or how to add a lot of chlorine to take care of this high organic matter. So, the disinfection byproducts that are going to be formed are going to be at very high concentrations. That is something to keep in mind, right? So, types of DBPs, so trihalomethanes, we looked at that and haloestic acid. Estic acid is CH3COOH, haloacetic acid. So, here instead of H3, you can have CHCLCOOH, right? I think you can even have CHBR. COOH and so on and so forth, let us say different combinations, right? H2, I guess. So, these are called haloestic acids. But again, as we can see, for the total organic halogens, halogens, let us say Cl minus, Br minus, these uh, trihalomethanes and haloestic acids only cover around what is it? I guess 40 percent or 42 percent of the uh, total organic halogen concentration. There are other unidentified. Uh, what do we say organic halogens out there. So, again these wreak havoc with the aquatic ecosystem, you should not try to uh, you know or you should try to limit this whenever possible. So, we already looked at this right CHCl3 chloroform, uh, bromochloromethane, dibromochloromethane, CHBr3 bromoform. Okay, I guess I stand slightly corrected, earlier I was talking about something like CH2Cl, 
right so or Cl2 so that is not the case it is trihalo as you see everywhere it is trihalo or 3 halogens Cl3 3 Cl or 2 Cl 1 Br minus ok here I guess one of it is missing Br2 it is dibromo so dibromo chloromethane or bromo form let us say right so that is something to keep in mind that is why I guess it was called trihalo I stand corrected so haloestic acid again mono chloro 1 chlorine or Cl minus dichloro trichloro mono bromoestic dibromo so you can substitute accordingly in CH3 COOH all these are halogenated organics right so chlorine dosage now I want to know how much chlorine to add so we know that I am adding chlorine as an oxidizing agent and when I am adding that I need to take care of both the uh, oxidation of the organics and other reduced forms and also I need to have enough chlorine to kill my pathogens so two aspects right I need to take care of organics and other reduced compounds let us see let us say manganese iron or such and then I need to have enough left for my pathogens right so this is a aspect that I need to add so when I add chlorine or oxidizing agent I need to take care of both so I need to uh, look at this because I need to ensure adequate residual chlorine or ensure that so for that we have something that is called as breakpoint chlorination we will see how you know that comes about let us see before we go further one aspect to note is that we know from our wastewater relevant aspects that we have ammonia or NH3 uh, in our uh, solution and if we add an oxidizing agent we know that it can go to monochloramine and depending on the concentration of Cl or HOCl it will go to dichloramine and HCl2 and if I add it at a higher concentration or finally it can end up into NCl3 which is pretty uh, unstable and it will end up going to N2 nitrogen gas finally. So this is some background we looked at why did we look at that we were looking at formation of NH2Cl and NHCl2 which are themselves forms of combined chlorine which we add as disinfecting agents but we also need to be aware of this why because you know that in our wastewaters you can have NH3 so if I am adding HOCl to kill the pathogens the HOCl will not just uh, what do we say react with the pathogens it will react with whatever it sees out there right it is not so specific it is an oxidizing agent it when pre react with other organic matter it can react with the ammonia that is present right and after all this then I guess not after assuming that all of them are taken out then we will come to uh, what do we say providing the residual chlorine or free chlorine so that pathogens can be taken care of so this is the aspect we need to look at I need to add enough oxidizing agent or chlorine or HOCl to take care of the organic matter to take care of NH3 before I can take care of the pathogens so let us see what we have so here we have a good graph from our uh, two pieces of uh, uh, graphs or two graphs from Metcalf and Eddy. So what do we have? We have chlorine residual on the y axis and on the x axis uh, what do we have? I think we are increasing it out here transformation of ammonia Cl2 and such right ok. So let us uh, look at that. So here what is it now as I add it right uh, from here I am starting to add. So here what is happening initially you have destruction of chlorine due to oxidizable substances such as Fe2 plus Fe2 plus right can go to Fe3 plus by giving out its electron let us say so it is an electron donor and my Cl2 or HOCl or oxidizing agents they will accept an electron. So whenever I have Fe2 plus they will readily consume my oxidizing agent let us say. Right. So, that is why when I have reducing agents such as Fe2 plus or H2S they will be immediately consumed. So, there is no residual chlorine as I keep adding it right keep adding my oxidizing agent or the chlorine. So, it is uh, everything will be oxidized or all the oxidizing agent is consumed and then by here I am done with all the uh, readily oxidizable uh, compounds like Fe2 plus and H2S. So now as I keep adding more chlorine what is going to happen now right. So here the NH3 that is in the water will start reacting with the HOCl or Cl2 that I am adding 
and it will first form monochloramine and if I increase the concentration it will form dichloramine. So, that is what uh, you will see here. So, formation of chloro organic and chloramine organ uh, and chloramine compounds let us see. But again keep in mind this is chloramine residual. So, even if it is a combined form that is why we are saying that it is increasing let us see. So, this is increasing, but if I keep adding more what is going to happen? If I keep adding more I know that it is going to be further oxidized to nitrogen trichloride which is unstable and it will go to N2 right. So, it is uh, leaving the system let us see right. So, the reform of this uh, combined chlorine it is not now NH2Cl and then NHCl2 is increasing here. But after I keep adding more chlorine, now it is going to NCl3 which will readily go to N2 gas, it is leaving the system. There is no oxidizing agent uh, or you know the uh, combined chlorine is now decreasing right. So, that is what we see destruction of chloramines and chloro organic compounds, they transform to nitrogen gas and go. So, that is why even though I keep adding chlorine, you know the residual chlorine is now coming down these combined chlorines also we are considering as residual chlorine that is why in this phase we see that it increasing until a peak. After I add more chlorine due to the relevant stoichiometry you see that it now starts degrading to NCl, NCl3 and N2 this is NCl3 and N2 gas let us see right. So, at this point there is no more H2S or Fe2 plus no more organics and all the ammonia has been consumed by this point and this is called that uh, break point let us see. So, whatever chlorine I add from here will be the free residual chlorine right. So, combined residual and this is the free residual chlorine and this I can uh, be sure will be available to kill the pathogens. So, what do we have here? Formation of free chlorine and presence of chloro organic compounds which are not destroyed. So, free residual chlorine. So, this is break point chlorination. So, whenever I add chlorine I need to add this enough chlorine to take care of all the compounds that can oxidize my chlorine or the oxidizing agent like HOCl and then I will get that. So, that is what we have here the break point chlorination. So, here we have the uh, what do we say NH4 plus and combined uh, chlorine initially most of it is present as NH4 plus. But as I add Cl2 I know that chloramines are being formed. So, NH4 plus concentration comes down, but this total which is NH4 plus plus chloramines you know it is still there. Why? Because during this point NH4 plus is being transformed into NH2 Cl, but after a certain point I know that nitrogen gas will be given out that is why this total is decreasing and that is this break point that we saw just a different profile. So, another aspect to note is that if I have wastewater containing ammonia nitrogen or wastewater containing ammonia and organic nitrogen, the profile will be slightly uh, different depending on the organic content. So, that is what you see here, you would not see such a sharp break point, but you will see such a tapered one I guess right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, chlorination break point we already looked at that, low point of the chlorine residual is called break point right. So, for example, we saw something like this initially everything is consumed then chloramines are formed and then the peak comes N2 is being given out all the chloramines are going to N2 and this is the minimum and then whatever I add keeps increasing that is why it is linear here. All this is the residual chlorine from here this is the break point here that is something to keep in mind. And in general we want it residual chlorine such that it is 0 0.2 milligrams per liter at the end of the uh, or at the uh, furthermost point on the distribution system. Why? Let us say I am staying far away and I need to see to it that there is enough chlorine to tackle any uh, microbial uh, growth or any intrusion of sewage or such that can uh, tamper or pollute my distribution network, right. So, I need sufficient uh, residual chlorine and sufficient one is supposed to be 0.2. But if it is greater than 0.5 milligrams per liter it becomes objectionable and in India typically we exceed this particular limit. So, disinfectant removal. So, again as we mentioned earlier disinfection byproducts can be formed. So, you do not want to have too much chlorine or even 
other than formation of disinfection byproducts, too much chlorine is also toxic to us and objectionable. So, you can remove chlorine. But how will you remove chlorine? You know that chlorine is an oxidizing agent, it is an electron acceptor. So, you can add any other benign electron donor, let us see, or reducing agent. Chlorine is an oxidant, so it can readily react with SO2. So, if I add SO2 to HOCl, so SO2, right, a reducing agent will be oxidized to SO4 2 minus HOCl, which is an oxidizing agent, right, will be reduced to Cl minus. You can check the oxidation states of sulfur and oxidation states of Cl, let us see, and then you will understand which one is increasing and such. But as you can clearly, sulfur is being oxidized, right, and Cl is being reduced. So, that is what you can do. And SO2 again with NH2Cl or combined type of chlorine, again different kinds of uh, reactions, let us say. Or SO2 in water can form uh, sulfurous acid, right, not sulfuric acid. And sometimes we can add this itself directly, sulfite, a strong reducing agent, it can be added as Na2SO3, sodium sulfite, sulfite, let us say. All these are reducing agents. Why are we adding them? To take care of the high or possibly high oxidizing agent concentration. That is why we looked at electron transfer or briefly looked at the redox uh, reaction related aspects, right. So, ozone disinfection, until now we were looking at Cl2 or combined forms of uh, what do we say uh, chlorine and so on and so forth. Now, let us look at ozone, it is the most uh, or one of the most or I think second most oxidized, uh, strongest oxidizing agent available. The strongest one is the hydroxyl radical that is also formed in or during ozonation of water. Ozone is a gas, it can be produced in situ with corona discharge, you have ozone generators. As we mentioned, it is much more powerful than HOCl. It will directly oxidize the cell wall of the microbes, similar to the action of your particular uh, chlorine or the chlorine based oxidizing agents. Depending on the pH, it can also form another strong oxidizing agent, which is OH minus. And the half reaction, where uh, we see that it is an electron acceptor, is this. It can also lead to increase in concentration of water. So, that is reason, one reason why I like addition of ozone, right, addition of ozone. Why is that? When I add ozone, the dissolved solids, total dissolved solids in the water are not increasing. But if I add Cl2 or such, we see that we are adding Cl minus to the solution. So, we are adding the total dissolved solids, which is never good in general. So, here with ozone though, we are adding oxygen to the water. And also ozone we know is a very strong oxidizing agent, it will also be able to degrade the residual organic content pretty well and disinfection byproducts are pretty less or non-existent especially if there is no Br minus. If there is Br minus, it can react with ozone to form some disinfection byproducts, but that is typically uh, not, a, not an issue. Again as I mentioned, it depends on Br minus concentration. So, this is dissolved I guess, right. So, let us move on. So, how do I understand that it is a strong oxidation uh, oxidizing agent compared to OCl minus? We look at PE naught. So, PE naught is at the standard conditions minus log activity of this hypothetical electron. So, it is logarithmic based. So, 28 and 35. So, 10 power 7 times I guess, right. So, 35 minus 28 is 7, but PE is log. So, you understand how strong the oxidizing agent is or uh, ozone is compared to OCl minus. Let me move on. So, advantages in general does not form harmful DBPs, very effective against taste and water uh, causing compounds and because of its fast kinetics and relatively high oxidation potential, you are going to have less contact time, but does not create disinfecting re residual. Why? Because it is so fast acting, the kinetics are so fast of this particular oxidant that it does not stay in water for long. So, if I ozonate it now, I think 30 minutes later you are done with most of the ozone will be uh, degraded, let us say. But that is not the case with chlorine. So, you can have ozonation to take care of your uh, residual organics and pathogens and add some chlorine so that you can have your, uh, what is this, residual chlorine, let us say. And obviously, it needs a more capital intensive setup, thus it is more costly than chlorine disinfection. 
So UV the last one which is not a chemical based UV. So we have visible light here light right you can see my face because they have the light set up here. UV you cannot see that ultraviolet radiation yes. So here the disinfection is caused by directly damaging the nucleoids let us say or nucleic acids I think I have a picture later. Depending on the mode of operation it can form hydroxyl radicals but we are not concerned about it now especially when you have UV and in, wa in water and add H2O2 to water you will form this very strong hydroxyl a uh, very strong oxidizing agent which is this hydroxyl radical. So the radiation is produced by UV lamps and there are different kinds of lamps low pressure though I, uh, I guess it is a uh, misnomer to say it is low pressure but the primary aspect of low pressure or UV L, UV L low pressure is that they emit light not light radiation only at one wavelength this is 254 nanometers or to be specific 253.7 nanometers. It is of great relevance because at this particular uh, what do we say UV wavelength or wavelength pardon me most of the uh, DNA and RNA of concern will absorb the UV or the radiation and if they can absorb it at that particular wavelength obviously the energy is going to be transferred and you will have damage of the RNA or DNA and thus inactivation of the relevant pathogens. With respect to medium pressure lamps it is not as if they do not emit what do we say UV uh, monochromatically this is monochromatic UV, UV monochromatic radiation here they give it out at a range of uh, wavelengths. But uh, what are the issues here interferences not inferences interferences due to absorption of radiation absorption of radiation by other dissolved substances. For example, here is my UV lamp right say submerged and the water is flowing around it the and this is my cell and the cell has to absorb or you know uh, the UV has to penetrate that particular cell or the UV radiation or photon has to reach that cell. But if I have suspended solids or other compounds which absorb the UV meaning uh, other interferences then obviously the effectiveness is going to be limited. So I might then need to have higher intensity that is what we are saying. So just let us look at this. So what do we have here 100 to 400 nanometers around this I guess or 500 to or beyond 600 nanometers it is visible I guess. But what is this uh, range let us look at that between 100 to 200 UV is absorbed by water itself and between 300 to 400 region where neither DNA nor water absorb UV. But there is a sp sweet spot between 200 to 300 where uh, which we call as the germicidal range germicidal range where the DNA and RNA absorb UV let us see right and that leads to damage of the uh, what do we say RNA or DNA and that will affect the replication of the relevant uh, pathogen. So UV as I mentioned monochromatic low pressure lamp UVL, UVL it will emit light or not light radiation only at 254 nanometers that is what we see here. But UV medium pressure it will emit radiation over a range it will be effective if we have what do we say pathogens that uh, what do we say absorb light at uh, radiation I should not say light radiation at different wavelengths and ineffective if they do not absorb radiation at the different wavelengths. So that is something to keep in mind let us see. Right. So, here is one graph that was presented by my advisor during my time. So, here we see that at 254 nanometers you know DNA absorption is pretty good let us see right. So, ratio of lambda by 2 lambda at 254 nanometers and here we see the uh, wavelength let us see right comparing the spectra for parvum and coliphage with absorption spectrum for DNA let us see right. So, you can see that it is uh, pretty good at 254 you see the peak right and that is why 254 is remarkably effective at killing or not killing inactivating pathogens. So that is why you would see many people uh, trying to sell UV boxes or UV radiation chambers for let us say as corona killer blah blah and such. But again if I have a paper and I put it in a UV chamber you know okay the top surface bottom surface not really. And again contact time is an issue so these UV based the radiation chambers for killing corona 
especially corona virus on surfaces i would say all these are mostly trash or you know uh, short term uh, stars let's say right so again it's with respect to how effectively the uv can uh, penetrate or be accessible or be absorbed by the corona virus if it can't it can't kill the uh, virus let's say right and how is it that it works uv so uv as we know can be absorbed by dna or rna so micro so viruses let's say talk about viruses can have dna or rna let's say dna looks like will help or will tell you how the structure will develop and rna will dictate how the metabolic process go through or take place so in dna as we mentioned earlier we have uh, different nucleic acids so there are four nucleotides of concern adenine guanine thymine and cytosine i guess hopefully the, my pronunciation is not too far off from the correct pronunciation so a g t and c let's see and this uv will be absorbed by this thymine yes and after uv radiation you know dimerization will occur right thymine dimerization so why is this relevant let's say because with normal dna this is how replication will take place you know dna replicating as in the cell is replicating the microorganism or pathogen is replicating it's growing if it doesn't grow it will die soon you know the last uh, lifetimes are pretty short obviously right so here though with respect to this uh, change in the dna you know the replication stops at that particular dimerization so that's how i guess you are going to have uh, uh, what do we say uv uh, inactivating microbes and sometimes people talk about okay it does not kill kill it does not disrupt the cell wall well as you see pathogen does not survive out there for a long time at least in water and such right so in general replication is what we want to stop if we do that effectively especially if we do that effectively so as you see the uh, uv radiation is pretty good way to go about it but again uh, even uh, with respect to other disinfecting agents and such different viruses they can uh, repair themselves and that will also be the case uh, with respect to some repairing whenever they are affected by uv radiation but let's not go there let's see. so disinfection kinetics it's modified chick watson's law again we have a rate we have another rate constant instead of concentration we have intensity right effect to germicidal intensity how intense is it let's say for example if i take a uh, intensity meter and go out there in the sun in the afternoon the intensity is very high the reading is high in the night intensity is less right how much uh, what do we say energy per unit area per time that's what it's going to give me an idea about what is energy per time joule per second per area let's say and microbial concentration i plug it into the reaction or equation for plug flow this is what i get and i right which is nothing but what is it energy per time right per area right uh, energy meaning you know we know that hc by lambda for a photon uh, with lambda wavelength so that's how we can get it so if i multiply that by theta or the time so i'll get energy i into theta will be energy per area which is called the dose that is what we have uv dose 140 millijoules per centimeter square so all those people who sell random uv lamps so you need to be concerned about what is the intensity how much is the contact time it will achieve and is there uniform what do we say distribution of that uv intensity without that the relevant chamber is just junk so how does it work typically we have the submerged uv lamps and i think we saw this even in the case of the iit rurki sbr plant where we had a submerged system so this is what it looks like there is a quad sleeve why quads because glass will absorb uv so uv won't pass through and if you don't have the sleep sleeve water will come in contact with the lamp and obviously you are going to have short circuiting so you will have a quad sleeve within that you will have the uv and uv will come out and obviously uh, will penetrate the quads or pass through the quad sleeve and then you are going to have irradiation of the water again because the kinetics is so fast uh, especially intensity you can maintain it pretty well you are going to have uh, what do we say just small chambers being good enough to cause your uh, relevant disinfection especially with uv 
obviously scaling and such you have to look at it, but that is a different aspect. Operation characteristics, obviously UV, if there is a light there is disinfection, no UV, no disinfection. So, there is no chance of residual, so that is one aspect. Turbidity has to be low, otherwise due to interferences, the other compounds suspended solids will absorb the UV. Simple operation, but I need to clean the surfaces that come in contact with uh, waste water to minimize biofilms that can again absorb UV, let us see. So, we have one question and I will end today's session and disinfection and waste water uh, with this session. What is the pH of a water at 25 degrees centigrade that contains 0 0.5 milligrams per liter of hypochlorous acid, okay. So, the question is not very well framed, but we will frame it better later on. So, uh, there is what is the pH of a water that contains 0 0.5 milligram per liter of uh, HOCl at equilibrium, assume equilibrium has been reached. So, this is the key, it is not as if it is being added initially I guess. So, neglect dissociation of water, not a great aspect, but fine and report the answer to two decimal places, okay. First thing is I have this which is HOCl concentration, right and I am going to have to look at it, right. Again, this is not a well framed question, but we will try to make do with what we have. Also, if the pH of solution was increased or decreased to 2 to 7, what would be the OCl minus concentration in milligram per liter? So, let us see what the approach is. First, what are the equations that we want or such? Before that, we want pH, pH equal to minus log concentration of H plus. So, one unknown is H plus and HOCl will be in equilibrium with OCl minus and H plus, let us say, right. So, this is a potential unknown, one unknown, one unknown, three unknowns, but pH is what we are trying to find and HOCl is what we already have. So, we need a way to be able to you know get or uh, what do we say calculate OCl minus. So, in effect we have two unknowns let us say right, in effect we have two unknowns because HOCl is known. So, I, have two, I need to have two equations to be able to solve for this. Certainly, one equation is that Ka is equal to what now? Uh, I know that Ka equation is equal to activity or concentration of H plus into concentration of OCl minus by concentration of HOCl, right. So, this is one equation. So, here you see the issue with why I say the question was not very well framed, but uh, you know assuming that water is not dissociating which is not a great uh, way, water not dissociating meaning water will always dissociate into H plus and OH minus, but here they are asking us to assume that this does not happen. So, that is not a great aspect, but why is it that they are asking us to assume that because then you can say that whatever HOCl has dissociated will either be as OCl minus as H plus, meaning OCl minus concentration will then be equal to H plus, but that is not the uh, usual case why H plus can you know uh, react with OH minus to go to H2O, but that is what they said do not uh, look at that. So, in effect our two unknowns become one unknown and with just this one equation we can solve for this unknown, right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, what do we have? We have that know that Ka is equal to, but we just uh, saw that if it is at equilibrium and if water dissociation is not considered OCl minus and H plus concentration will be the same let us say. So, assuming that this will transform into H plus square by HOCl and I know HOCl concentration, I know Ka or pKa, pKa is 7.5, so Ka is 10 power minus 7.5, so from that I can calculate my H plus, let us see what we have. So, HOCl milligrams to moles per liter. So, what do we have? I think uh, how much are we adding? HOCl is 0 0.50 milligram per liter. So, I am not sure why my student took it as 50 milligram per liter. So, we can consider that to be a typo either in the question or here. So, let us just say it is 50 milligrams of HOCl per liter of water. I want to convert this into moles because all these equations, let us say, in the equilibrium constant, this equation all the units are in moles per liter, let us say, or molar units, let us say, 
in general it is supposed to be molar but for now we will consider molar units. So, how do I do this? I need to get the molecular weight let us see right. So, if I have that I will have grams of HOCl per 1 mole of HOCl. So, grams of HOCl, grams of HOCl cancel out and I will get it. So, what is the molecular weight? So, looks like it is uh, 52.45 H is 1, O is 16 and Cl minus is 35.45. So, 17, 7 plus 5 I guess yes 52.45 let us say right 17 plus 15 fine 52.45. So, that is 52.45 grams of HOCl per mole. So, they cancel out and the units you can look at it if there was an error made here. It looks like I see that I get it in terms of 9.53 into 10 power minus 6 uh, moles I guess. Uh, because of the way it was calculated I am not sure if uh, okay milligram per gram. So, it should probably be moles again we are looking at the approach not the actual answer. Then we move on we know that this is the equation and Ka is equal to this Pka equal to 7.54 it seems. So, from that Ka is equal to 10 to the power of minus 7.54 meaning Ka equal to this you can plug this into the calculator and HOCl we just calculated that to be 9.53 into 10 power 6 molar or moles per liter. So, at equilibrium assuming water dissociation does not take place this is the case, but again in the questions that I ask I am not going to do this. So, from that I can plug it, it into that equation that I wrote down earlier and I see to get a pH of 6.28. Again this is the approach, but if there are any calculation errors you can look at that. And then you know people ask uh, if the pH is increased to 7, what will be the OCL minus concentration. So, the approach here should be let us say I know the equilibrium concentration of HOCL to be 9.53 into 10 power minus 6. I know that OCL minus concentration will be equal to the H plus concentration from here that is equal to 5.24 into 10 power minus 7. So, the total OCL or OCL total which is equal to HOCL plus OCL minus will always be constant because we have this graph if you remember this is HOCL this is OCL minus HOCL OCL minus. So, you see the maximum here let us say this is it. So, if I at any point the total will be the same this plus this. So, if the pH is 3 or if the pH is let us say 11 or 10 the total will always be the same OCL total will be the same. So, using that I can calculate it why I need two equations now because if I change the pH which was at 6.28 and take it to pH of 7 what is happening we have this graph right let us have this. I know that the pKa is 7.5 right. So, earlier it was at 6.2 right 6.2. So, if I increase it to 7 I am going out here let us see let me try to draw that in a better manner here. So, this is my HOCl which is decreasing with increase in pH and the other one is my OCl minus and this point is 7.5 and earlier I got my pH to be 6.28. So, at 6.28 let us say that this is the case at 6.2 let us say this is 6.2 this is the case right, but if I increase that to pH of 7 obviously this will be the case, but one aspect to note is that the total total of HOCl and OCl minus will be the same. So, that is the key to get the second equation OCL total is HOCl plus OCl minus and we already have another equation for Ka. So, I have two unknowns which are HOCl and OCl minus these are my two unknowns because pH is 7 H plus is already known. So, I have two unknowns two equations what are the two equations one is this equation and the other one is the Ka equation right. So, I have two unknowns and I have two equations I can solve it. that is the way to go about it, but people typically make uh, blunders let us see if my T A was able to get it right or wrong. So, he says Ka, Ka is equal to H plus OCL minus by HOCl fine 
h plus is 10 power minus 7 fine that is a known value k a is already known so that is also fine we have that. So, okay, now we see that O C L minus and he is substituting this H, H plus and uh, such into this which is also fine. But again as is the case and how this is how people make errors. So, he took the H O C L concentration from part A to be the same as here. But you should know better as you saw here the H O C L concentration at 6.2 was this. But after increasing the pH it will decrease. So, the HOCl concentration is not the same. So, the approach should have been this. So, this is a common mistake that uh, people make. So, I wanted to use the uh, issue at hand to be able to illustrate this. So, I guess with that we are done with uh, disinfection. So, we are done with uh, waste water. So, from the next session we will start looking at uh, water treatment and how to go about it. Again what is the principle? Well, I think we looked at this uh, pretty well. So, thanking you for your patience, I will end today's session.